I don't know where it came from, but what 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 what, what I saw was the arm and the chief of the Ujana Mary came to me that these weapons do things were for us, they were for the National Patriotic Front. What they would do is that they would not have this thing transported in their military vehicles. We have to find civilian trucks and we will pay for these trucks to ship this weapon to, uh, to the border of Liberia. And that took another time. We got confused. Till I had passed and gone to uh, the border, I had gone to Bopley already. I didn't know I was there waiting. And he also was waiting for me. No way to get any information to him. And I didn't have money. And while I was there, there were questions from Kofi Kona, who is still there, what kind of man is he? And uh, he heard that the man broke jail in, uh, in America. Is he a good man? Is he a man to support? But I defended him in all these questions. I told him, yes, yeah, Stella was a good man. Uh, this is your politicking, and uh, he's capable. He's a good man to work with, and, and all of that. You know, they were trying to find out who Stella was. But I defended him. Now that I must admit. And while I was there, no ammunition, people are dying at the war front, the confusion broke up, soldiers getting hurt, and no ammunition. So tell I got a little bit confused. He said, but I'm, I'm sure that the, the weapons are there in Abidjan. Why is it that Moses is not bringing these things? Then the late uh, Barclay, I will call his first name. Barclay was a police officer here at the police training. And he had a stroke and he died and quite recently. So Barclay was sent to me in Abidjan by Taylor to find out to find out what, what, what was happening. So I told him, well, look, the, the things are here, but then we do not have the money to transport them. So I'm only here and wasting time. And Kofi Conan, the defense minister of Cote d'Ivoire, just bought me a new jacket, a new sneakers, you know. So I'm looking a little bit decent. I'm not looking like a fighter now. So, so he, when he looked at me, he said, but man, where you got money from? You buying this, he looking correct. He bought me a wash also. That evening, he said he was coming to me. Now knew he had gone back to Bobble in Liberia. We were complaining to Taylor that the weapons that I went for, I had given them over to Prince Johnson. I sold everything to Prince Johnson. I mean, Abishan and Zuti, and then having good time. The next morning, Taylor called by the, by the Shana Mary radio in Cote d'Ivoire that I should report to Bobble. That morning, I joined a bus and I drove into Danane. I walk across some, some kind of bush road we used to take. And I crossed to Bobble in our military camp. Upon my arrival, I was arrested by Benjamin Yeten immediately. Died. Put me into a cell, into a jail. Where we were, you know, keeping the war prisoners from the floor from the Liberian Air Force soldiers captured in war where we used to keep them. I was there all bloody all because they come with blood and all on them. So I heard my colleagues by my prison window, they said, we'll kill a kill man tomorrow, a damn man from Tapeta. He went and stole our arm and ammunition. He will be executed tomorrow morning. So I regretted, you know, to join MPFL to, to be killed like that. You know, I thought sure I was going to die. But as God would have it, the following morning, Kofi could not call from Abishan again. He told him, but Moses blood disappeared. We cannot, because in my house, uh, the man is always coming to eat in the morning. Why well, we cannot see him? Till I say, I'm coming there myself. Then he went on to Abidjan. So Kofi said, but where is Moses Bla? He said, oh, Moses Bla was here, and uh, he disappeared. He said, no, till I say, I got him. I locked him up because he sold everything that he's supposed to collect here to Prince Johnson. The, the, the minister laughed. He said, no, that cannot be truth. He said, this is a man who defended you here in your absence. The man said, you are a decent person. This man said, you are a good person. You are a man to work with. And he cannot be the same one to, to betray you like that. He said, this is not a true story. 
Then he told the lie again and said, well, look, then if Moses is in jail by you to be executed, then it means that everything that people say about you is truth. And uh, just a minute, uh, let me talk, he went to the president, he said, let me see my president come. He went, he came back from, from Ophi Boyan. He said, look, I will tell you one thing, if Moses does not come to receive this thing because he has been introduced to the Chandamari commander here, and nobody else should go into the camp to where we had these things. So if he does not come, if you don't bring him, we would not release a weapon to you. And he returned that evening. He came about midnight. He and his brother Batu came about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And he came to me in the same prayer, sardine, mattress. So I said, but what is happening? Batu said, you just wait. Tomorrow we'll find a fact. Because I was sleeping on a piece of mat, you know, while I was in the jail. I mean, going to die, I mean, I was no respect anymore. And so all of that money, he called a group, of man, colleagues, some from the war, from the battle group commanders. And he said, look, gentlemen, why you people have to lie on Moses' plow? The man is in Abidjan doing his work. Because there was no money to hire trucks to bring this in. That was brought a delay. He said, you Prince Barclay, who gave you the information that the man has sent this thing over to Prince Johnson? He said, but then you have to apologize to him. That you are lied on him. And almost causing you death for nothing. So the group came, they all apologized. Oh, sorry, 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 Chief, Chief. So I said, well, Chief, let me say one thing. Please, please let me go and fight. I'm trained as a gorilla. Anywhere in your control area, I can fight. I can maneuver. But I don't want to do this kind of operation. I will die for nothing because of lies. He said, no. He called me in his room. He apologized. He said, look, Moses, please, please don't mind the girl boys. He said, this is why Samuel Kayan do was killing people, you people. And we said that he was doing you harm. It's like your own self. You were killing yourselves. Why? These boys will come to me by night to say you are giving every weapon that we have over to Prince Johnson to fight us. And while he was in Abidjan talking to the Mary base to see what we had and where the pins were kept and they were intact. So he said, but here are the things here. These are the things that the boys say you sold or you are giving them over to Prince uh, Johnson and your brother. He told me, he said, please, go back and bring those things, and I will decide whether you stay or go back on your assignment. So I went, and I chartered trucks, and we brought these things over to Bobley, and there was a very big dance. Everybody happy dancing because there were new weapons, and we were using something called Beretta, very old, you know, guns, and they were, they were, they were, they were, they were not uh, modern arms, and you cannot fight with that. The World War II weapons. But when I came this time, those weapons I brought were new AK-47, RPG, GMG, and they were all happy, everybody dancing. And they called upon the frontline commanders, they came and got their supplies, everybody went back to war, the war began to progress, everybody happy. So one day as a chief, I think, my request to you that I want to go to fight. I do not want to take this dangerous venture anymore. I'm sorry, sir. So he said, okay, I will take a decision, but you will have to come back when you are needed and I'll call you. Go to Tapeta, and when you go to Tapeta, you be there with the command to see the front line, see what is happening there. Then he had one old pickup. I don't know where they got it from. Old pickup with some funny tires. I drove that pickup. I passed through the butchers in the night. We used to pass the back road to get to Tapeta. So I went uh, that night. On my way, I had an accident. And uh, I managed to face the pickup at night. You know, some people were in the villages assisted me. And I drove on to Tapeta. I went to Tapeta. 
And uh, I reported to the battalion commander there at the time. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, uh, our commander, our, our leader has asked that I come here to, to work with you. He said, oh, yes, I got a position for you. You are a third platoon leader. At that time, there was really hard war because Doe was putting a defensive from Grand Jude and coming to take Tapeta and come to Sekaipi. So they were heavy fighting. So the, the commander then said, well, you have to be a third platoon commander. You have to go to fight. And I said, my God. Uh, I went the first day and uh, the company commander at the time received me in a town called Broad Diala, it's a, it's a border town with Cote d'Ivoire, I mean not Cote d'Ivoire, with, uh, with the Grand Jude. And this boy, he said, no, I cannot let you fight. When I was in Libya, you were my commander, and uh, I don't know what the battalion commander is talking about. What you were to, you, you, you're not a platoon leader, but you will be here, you are taking men on the ambush, and you will be carrying food to the fighting men, at the front line, those who sleep in ambush, you will go to change there in the morning and carry the new men to replace them. So I said, all right. I did that for about a week or two. Then the manager from Lac, they were finding a way to run because the tension was on that side. So he came with a brand new pickup that he was using. And he said, oh, I think uh, I will give you this pickup because I'm trying to uh, find my way, I want to escape to go. So I accepted the pickup. I thank him for the pickup. That afternoon, so happy for my new pickup, I drove the pickup to Tapeta. I'm from Tapeta. So when I drove the pickup to Tapeta, the battalion commander at the time for us in Tapeta saw me in my pickup. He said, You get them from that pickup. So I said, man, why, why? He said, well, I'm the battalion commander that does not have a car, and you have a brand new pickup, you have to get down. I said, I will not. He ordered him, man, so I had to rent for my AK-47 in my car, I took my gun, a big confusion. At that time, Taylor had just entered Tapeta. He was uh, going to the um, missionaries uh, up the hill. So they said, but there's a fighting in town that Moses Bly and the battalion commander. He said, I'll go and call him. So I went, I went to him. He said, but Moses, what happening? And I explained. I said, but I came here, and the battalion commander uh, made me a platoon, a uh, uh, third platoon leader, and uh, the, the company commander refused, and he said, instead, I should help him with uh, people on ambush and carry food. He said, you what? Who made you company commander? I said, the battalion commander said, so I sent for the man. So when the man came, he said, uh, when you were in Libya, who was your commander? Who was the last commander that brought you to Liberia? He said, that Moses Blah. He said, but I did not send the man here to fight. He said, in fact, let me tell you this man's position right now. He called the man, he said, this man is an inspector general for National Patriot Front, responsible for crime commit against human beings. And these people eat liquor thing you're doing. Raping people with me, looting here. He will put everything under control. He's not here to fight. He's your chief. He apologized to me. He said, well, I'm sorry. And uh, so that time I became big man. I, you know, uh, I, I, I have a position. And everybody was saluting me. And I said, well, thank God. And I got was I made fun to him with him. I said, Lord, you salute me because you battalion commander, I'm inspector general of the entire operation. And they begin to respect me by that. Then something else happened. One day I went on an inspection. Some people had beaten us, some people, some foreigners. Some Ghanaians, some Sierra Leoneans was coming from Ghana, I mean not Ghana, from Bikana and trying to find a way to hide in an old company camp called Flamingo Camp. Can you, and can you tell what year is this now? This is uh, 1990. 
1990, okay. so, so when uh, I arrested these soldiers, I arrested these soldiers and, uh, and tried to detain them. But then with MPF as Inspector General, I have a problem. The problem I was having is that there was a certain group called the EMG Battalion. They are Executive Mansion Guard Battalion. I cannot arrest them because they do not take order from me. It's directly from the, um, excuse me, they take direct, directive directly from the, uh, from the commander, commander-in-chief at the time. And they will commit crime, they will do, do, do some funny things, I will arrest them, but it was not possible because I was told that I have no authority over these guys. So they went there and beat these people. While I did, I took them to the hospital, took some of the people to be and, and And I decided, what I did was, I said, well, look, send the, the Nigerian, the Selenian, and you people are moving there, hearing it, that Nigerian, uh, I mean, not Nigerian, Ghanaians, I hear him in, in, a, in a huge number, and they say, Ekomo coming there comprises of Ghanaian, and they are killing these people. I will take them in a camp, 6,000 human beings. I took this boy in a camp, I asked the, uh, the cadet release people for the trucks, and I transported them in this camp, and they were giving me food to fuel them. I put them in Flamingo camp for about half a year. They were born in babies, some were dying from hunger. So, some group of my men, my colleagues, went again to Dela and said, Look, Moses Blah is over there and trying to group the Ghanaian and Nigerian, the Ekomo bringing them to fight. He opened a new way for them and they're going to fight us from Flamingo camp. So I went to Dela sign again to find out what was I doing. So I said, No, chief. These are armless people. These are people from Marshall, from Bikana, from, from other parts of uh, the coastline, and are trying to keep them. If you want to become president of this country, and these boys are going and killing the people, looting their money, looting their things, it won't work out well with us. You say, okay, Moses, you go back and do your work. But what you will do, if you are protecting them, put a gate that no soldier without an authority will pass, go to this camp. That was also terrible for me. Before he, that order was given me, these boys, my boys used to go there and then when the one woman they were asleep because these are girls running from war and they know where to go somewhere. Student of Basa High School, decent looking people, but they were foreigners. So when I put this kid, I became big enemy to my boys. But I got to have it, we control the situation. One evening, I came to Tabata. And there was a radio announcement that uh, we had people in, uh, in, uh, in Kipamos, two of our commanders in charge of Kipamos. They had just sent them there. And the treatment that they were receiving, the citizens, HAPA were receiving from them, it was not an easy thing again. So he called. Tell us he heard that from BBC. He said, Moses, I beg you, there's another assignment again. You have to go to Bikin, I mean, uh, Maryland, at the southeastern region, Sino, Maryland. You will be the commander. I beg you. Go there and try to control the situation. Upon arriving there, one of the commanders ran away, he escaped. But anyway, I grabbed one, tied him, put him in the back of a car, and sent him over to Banga. And I took over Kipamos. I went to Tabu, people who ran away from our own group. I, I went, I brought a car, I took the people back to Kipamos. I, uh, I called the Benis that were there, you know, they were also hiding. I told them to open stores. If anybody, any soldier from my command 
takes anything from you, bring the complaint. I will know what to do. In the process, one morning, before I even took full control of the place, one of my soldiers said a boy took a cap from his head. He took by the man, took a cap, bound. He shot the man. The man died on the spot. So I said, what? They came and come and say, one of your killed one man. He said, the man took a cap from his head. So I took radio and called till I said, but you, this is somebody that committed murder, committed murder here. What can we do? He said, but set up a boy, investigate the man. If the man is guilty, you know, he died like the man too. Exactly what I did. And we shot this man. He was guilty for just shooting people for nothing. We killed this man. Then the people of Maryland began to return. One of the commanders at the time, he had taken all the people vehicles, the United Nations vehicles, the people trucks. Then he had seven wives. Then the women, all of them had their name on the vehicles. And <laughs> they had their names on the vehicles. So I called a conference, executive conference. I called the people of Kipamas in the town hall. I said, Yo, please come and listen to me. Anybody here that makes a property generator, cars, please come up with me and come and identify your things in this uh, my commander's house. As we went closer, you have my truck there, you have my taxi there, you have my pickup there, you have my generator there. So I told the person, look, as you identify your thing, please take it out. I told the, the superintendent at the time, I said, please, please identify that this thing belongs to the people. They too could be looting other poor properties. He said, no, that I right for uh, properties owner. So I gave the properties back to them. My name was Moses Blair when I was in Kipamos. Later, the people of Kipamos called me Pabla. This is why my name is Pabla today. People don't even know me when they're writing me. They call me Mr. Pabla, you know, so uh, my name is Moses Blair. And uh, the people returned, the people came home, and we were living there very, very fine. Very, very fine. Then I left and came to Marova for inspection. One of our big men saw my pickup and he said, the pickup tire is a very fine pickup tire. You in Kibamas, you are enjoying. What we will do is that then we got to change you as Inspector General to come to Banga and let somebody else go to Kibamas. I didn't talk, I thought he was joking. And I went back to Kibamas. When I was in Kibamas, for the second time, there were containers and rubbers and everything inside. So I said, but what is continuous here? We're now inspecting this place, and we're thinking about people threatening to come and attack us. So I ordered my soldier, bust the container open, with the two containers. There were two jeeps in the container. So we bust the thing open. We took one of the jeeps, our first, the white one, and then we took the red one, and the rubber, I saw people at the port. Nobody should come and take this rubber from here until we find out from the commander-in-chief. Then I called Banga. I said, but there's a, there are two containers here. We're getting ready for shipment when we enter, and there are two chips inside. And I'm taking a short one to use, and one I want to give one to this uh, heaven social welfare people. That one government agent said well, that there was no car. So I said, look, for you to keep working here, you will take one of the jeeps to use because you do not have a car. Then he said, in fact, you come with a jeep. Let me see what a car looks like. I drove from Kipamos to Banga. When you look at the jeep, he laughed. He said, oh, I thought it was a decent car. Report got to me already that you burst into the container, you tow vehicles. He said, there's nothing. You take the same and use it. So I drove back to Kipamos with his uh, shop based jeep. It's not, if they were used by the company, it was nothing new. So I drove back to Kipama with a car. And I, I don't know what happened to it. I think I gave it to one of my commanders to use or so. And I was there. Then as this man was joking, 
will mean that I have stayed long in Kipamas. The decision I reached already to uh, the commander in chief that I come back to Banga. He called me and said, Well, you have to come to Banga because of, uh, you are inspector general, you would not stay in one place for a long time. And, and I, that's what I did, and I came back to Banga. And I replaced immediately. The man who replaced me, he saw the stores all open, the fishermen working the fish. So he assigned people at the pier while the people were bringing the fish. He was just taking fish. He goes to the store. He would not buy anything. He said, but I mean, he told me before I left, he said, if I'm in Cape I would not buy clothes. And my children would not buy clothes. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to take them. He said, but there's a free place, there are free things here. You are an old person, that's why. So the fellow, he did, I don't know why he did. And he was also order tied. And uh, I don't know how he left there because I wasn't there. And the company, he ordered the logging companies, uh, why he did, I know. They, he ordered the, uh, order, I mean, the logging companies to pay $50,000 a month and open a gas station for him. If not, they will not do the logging in the area. Uh, he accepted some money from them. The report came to Banga. And I went to tell her, I said, no, you arrest the man. Bring the man to me. And he came and he admitted. And uh, I don't know what happened. He died in the process. I don't know. That one left with he and the commander in chief. A long story. I was in Banga. Then we came to Morovia. Taylor became president. We came to Morovia. Taylor had decided to go to Libya for a visit. And when he became president, he said, well, look, you have to take me to Libya. Uh, you were one of the commanders there, and uh, you are known there, and people respect you there. So when he became president, I went there. And while I was in Libya, we went to see Gaddafi. And it was not Taylor who recommended me to be uh, Libya, Liberian ambassador to Libya. It was Gaddafi. And when you saw me, he recognized me. He said, Musa. He said, Musa. So uh, Brother Taylor said, oh, the man know you. I said, yeah, well, yeah, I was the adjutant here. Yeah, he used to come to the base. Then... Uh, he told Taylor, said, well, if you want to send ambassador here, you have to send Musa to be your ambassador here. So he, Taylor too, said, oh, this man out here, Talibi. Talibi had been our supply man on the base. He used to bring food for us while we were in Tajura. So Taylor too said, look, uh, he said, Gaddafi, I think, he said, he said, leader, you, uh, then Talibi too will have to come to Liberia to be my, 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 uh, you are ambassador to me. And they both agreed. Then I came and uh, that's how I became ambassador in Libya and Tunisia. And uh, Talibi too came to Liberia. I wonder he stay here or he had left. I don't know. And I became ambassador. I was there for about three years as Liberian ambassador to Libya and Tunisia. But uh, I came home to take my children. Yes, okay, as the story goes. You had to be uh, <clears throat> a patient with me because it has been long. It's uh, roughly 20 years ago, and I can't uh, remember exactly what I've seen, but I, I can record. This is why it's difficult to say the date and time. So, uh, But uh, the event uh, happens. So this is why I'm trying to uh, pick in what I can remember. So when I came back to uh, Liberia <clears throat> to, take, uh, to take my children, that when Ina Dugulia died, the first uh, vice president for President Taylor government. And when Ina died, each time I want to go, I would tell, look, chief, I want to, uh, to go back uh, to post. He would say, oh, Moses, you wait. Oh, Moses, you wait. I didn't know his thinking. That he wanted me to become vice president in place of Ina Dogudia. So one afternoon, I will call upon to our party headquarters, MPP headquarters, and I met a heavy group. 
some big authority in my party. There were 50 persons already waiting. So they pulled it to a vote. And I was not in there. We were contesting, they put us outside. And when they called me in lastly, and they let's say, well, I recommend Moses Blah. He can do this job. And then they pull it to a vote. I saw everybody hand coming up. And he stated his reason why he wanted me to become vice president instead of uh, in place of uh, Inado Gulia. He said, I remember, he said when we started a revolution in Libya years back, his promise to us was that the second in command of his government must be from our group. From our tribe, in fact, because we fought along with him. And I became vice president of Liberia. I was vice president. I was doing my work fine. I was functioning as I should. Not until the trouble came in Ghana. He had gone to Ghana for peace talk. He has gone to Ghana for peace talk. And I was here as a vice president. And he was in Ghana also with my wife. My wife had gone to Ghana on a plane that took him to Ghana. He went with the president. And I was there with my children. I was hearing through my wife what was happening in Ghana, that he was coming back. When they went there, you know, the indictment over the, your president here, he's coming. Then a group of government officials came to me at my house. And they asked me, they said, but you have to announce to the public to tell them what is happening to the president. I said, no, I will not do this until I get an authority from the president. I have no so authority to go to radio and just talk on the government matters. If that directive comes from the president, we shall be willing to do. And that when Benjamin Yete went ahead of me and announced that... Uh, some kind of murder, bombardment will happen, and what, what, what. And that announcement came. But the, 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 the official legislature that asked me to do that, which I refused, because I was not authorized to do so. So it was Benjamin Yetan who gave the announcement. While in my house, a telephone call came from the American embassy, from from a man calling himself a charges affairs of the U.S. Embassy. He said, is it the vice president? I said, yes. He said, but uh, it's getting dark. And I put in his own word. He said, it's getting dark. And the notorious ATU are, are all in the streets. We can see their jeeps up and down. And, uh, we are afraid tonight there will be looting. There will be all kinds of things going on. What are you doing? But the president is not here. So I said, oh, no, I'm all here. Benjamin Yete, who is the chief security, is also here. So uh, I don't think you have fear. I I'm out here myself. I'm here. And anything, you can get in touch with me. Or oh, Benjamin Yete. That when he called Benjamin the phone, he said, well, I just spoken with the vice president. He said, you are the chief of SS. And you are also ordered to control crime tonight because the president is not here and they are hearing all kinds of news and your fighters are everywhere, you know, roaming the city. That from the American embassy, our telephone conversation. I put the phone on speaker for my bodyguards to listen to people who are working with us. But what the American men asking, why they are so afraid? And they said they are, they are powerful people. So they had a confusion, and I mean the conversation ended with me and that charged the affair of the American embassy. So when Taylor arrived that evening, I drove to Robert's Field to welcome him with Hawk and everything. Then he came to his house. He said, well, I'm not talking to anybody until tomorrow morning I will have a meeting. I went home, my wife had her bags in my car, luggages and things. She had gone there to buy her, you know, she had a boutique, and she went to buy her things. So it would be a little bit cheaper if she come in with government plane with the president and so on. So when she bought her things, the things were staying in my car. By the time I entered my house, her telephone call came from, 
from uh, white flour. Benjamin said, look, uh, uh, Mr. VP, you are needed by the president. So I said, oh, but the president already told me that uh, he will not see us until tomorrow morning. Why is he calling me again? So I told my wife, she said, well, let me put my things down. I said, no, yeah, I'm, I'm running to the president, I will come right back. But I entered Red Flower. I saw three men wear arms. They said, come out from the car. I got them and said, report to the president. When I went, the four cabinet was there, and a few legislators were in there with him already. He did not give me a seat. He said, you, Moses Blah, and did not even address him properly. The first time to happy. Hey, you, Moses Blah, you want to overthrow my government while I'm not here? I said, no. He said, did you talk to the American embassy? I said, yes. He said, but yeah, then you, you are guilty because you, you have no right to talk to the people from the American embassy. I said, well, will you allow me to explain, sir? He said, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Then other people, <laughs> other, other cabinet ministers were there. Oh, man, man, he's supposed to speak to the people. Man, he's supposed to speak to the people. The people, everybody were putting words, you know, like, you know, trying to crucify me. Well, I didn't, I didn't mind. I said, well, let me explain. I said, you were all over the country. Or call came from the American embassy. And what the man said was the, the notorious, uh, 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 how do you call it, ATU, and the, the 40 men are all in the street, and they are roaming the street. They are afraid. There won't be any control. So I told them, no, I'm here. And Benjamin, you tell who is the chief of security is here. That was what I said. He said, I said, I didn't, I didn't, I said, you can ask the Americans. We were talking, then a call came from the State Department. Because the American people are cutting the story. Then they told him that they never discussed cool with me. And what I said was exactly what I said. He said, I can't remember. You, pass, you finish your name. So they took my gun, the army, my pistol, took my cell phone. Brought me down roughly, you know. While we were going to Benjamin Yetin's house, then, 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 uh, two other fellas ran from the White Flower and called one Joe Twa on the side. And I know they brief you on what. Then he said, No, 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 uh, Chief, you should kill the man to my house. We Ben said, Why, 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 why don't you kill the man? So he said, No, you're killing the man to my house. We went in one squeezer room. They put me in a room with, 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 with some Sierleunians, uh, uh, fighters. About, about 50 surrounding so the house and speaking Creole, which I could not understand what they were talking. But what I could pick up from their talking was that, oh, we are carrying VP on the Ralphie Highway tonight. The VP going home tonight. Then while they were squeezing me in the room, one boy, he's here with me, my, my, my burglar. The boy sneaked with me in the room because they were rushing me. So he went under the bed. He wanted to see what would happen to me. They want to sleep. They said, let's pray. He and myself pray. So in the morning when they came to check on me, he was there. They said, what are you doing here? Who put you here? Who brought you here? They put him or they dragged him aside. Then he went. They told him to get away. Move from the area. Then he went. Then my wife fought her way to find me. When Nettie came, she said, Benjamin Yete, if my husband I will have to slow down because it brings tears. Excuse me, gentlemen. Sorry. It's okay, sir. Thank you. 
thank you thank you very much then my wife said if this man wants to overthrow the president is now court you must take my husband to court my wife believe in God So I, I told her, I said, please go home before Benjamin kill you. Then she said, I will die with you. So what I bring it here is uh, it was a lie. Why well, you must lie on me? But before this happens, Prentilla had called me earlier. He said, look, we give you one million dollars to do business. Leo Nyondwe Mokomla become the vice president of Liberia. Sure, in case I decide to leave, he will work in your place, which I accepted. Every day I go, to, I went to him. I was talking all this money. As a son, this is the case. She wear the money. Give me even half a year, you know. One third of the money it will be all right. Then he pull it to a judge. Oh, Moses, I'm just joking with you. You forget it. But then when I went to jail to be killed, then when I say, oh, I see. Maybe he didn't want to give me this money, and that he had to twist it this way. But he didn't say that from him off, so I knew. So my wife's too firm. My wife is a Christian, she's a pastor. She said, You will not die. Then my wife said one thing. She said, I have the courage. He said, this is the same tailor. When he calls you and you eat him, you will salute the food you are eating. Like tailor is standing before you. He said, this is a man you respect so much to turn to be the one to kill you. Well, but there's God. So the, uh, the legislators came in, they said, well, according to the law of this country, the speaker cannot become president in your place when the vice president is standing, is capable, he has become president here for three years, he is not sick. So the Monday man must be the second in your place. And that became... 22nd president of the Republic of Liberia. So, uh, Chairman, uh, thank you very much for your patience. I'm very sorry. Some of these stories can bring tears to you because very pitiful. The revolution, if I was a young man, that somebody called me now and said, let go what control this government. I will refuse because we came a long way and we passed through pins. Uh, I would say something again before I close from my side. We, I, 
time I'm a member of the National Patriotic Front of Liberia. One of the founding members, as I said, I was the first 20, 22 men group. It means that we started a revolution before all the people can follow us to go to Libya to train. Libya, while we were in training in Libya, Gaddafi talked to us. Gaddafi didn't want to bring trouble to the world. The Mataba, the name Mataba, I just mentioned to you, Mataba International was an organization, godly organization, that anybody who is oppressed by another group, that organization was there to free you. Like how we went to Gaddafi, and we talked to Gaddafi on how people being treated here, how people were behaving everywhere in this country, more especially the Gyo, the money trap. So he didn't like the idea. He wanted the government removed. So we can have a government, you know, acceptable to all. So everybody will be happy with this government. I think these are some of the, that what Gaddafi was thinking about. Gaddafi did not train us to say, you go at Africa, go at Côte d'Ivoire, go at Tagu. No, 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 no. I think that idea was different. Everything changed from the revolution. When we came to Monrovia, because we had special forces meeting, we used to meet regularly, we, to go according to the, 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 the guideline of the revolution. But when we got here, we have uh, people calling us a junior commando. We have other politicians that are coming in with their own intentions. Some people wanted to get rich overnight. And some people were really doing their work truly according to the revolution. The latter thing went in. You see, what makes up your game now. People got became bitterly rich in this country. That the money they get now, nobody can go close to, to them. Then I will express to you before I stop, Mr. Chairman, I'm afraid I might not go to court tomorrow because I went to the Hague and I said what I saw and, and, and I said nothing but the truth. And uh, upon arriving here in this country, I was sued in a civil law court by an individual. The case is still in court. The case that cost me already 20,000 United States dollars to pay lawyers. And this time maybe I'll pay 40, 50,000 dollars from talking to TRC. I don't know the procedure here. So these are my concerns. I want you to know. So I want to address myself to the issue. Because I, I have not come here to complain. I was just explaining what I saw and what, what, what I did. So I'm not taking anybody to court that what I said in the Hague, but it turned to a lawsuit here in Liberia. Up to now, nobody is talking. Maybe some, some, we well, got plenty of money, nobody, you know, can talk to you in this country. But we are waiting to see the result of this case. So I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. We very much appreciate that despite those troubling experiences, you have come and willing to speak the truth also before this body. Our country is in dire need of reconciliation and sustainable peace. We cannot bury those who have died based on falsehoods, and we cannot build reconciliation on falsehood either. And so we thank you very much for coming, and we'd like to add that Everybody who appears here before the commission are protected. Their testimonies cannot be the subject of any court action, whether a civil action or a criminal action. And this, I think, all Liberians have understood by now. Since our experience, we've had nearly nine to 800 witnesses so far coming before the commission, and, and only one has been attempted with a lawsuit. And that suit was dismissed instantly when the TRC made its representation and provided the needed protection for that witness. Uh, in so doing, we also say only the truth expressed here can be protected. 
what is not said before the TRC is not covered by the TRC protection. So that is why we encourage everybody to speak freely because we know this will help our country in its healing process. So we thank you very much. And with your indulgence, we'd like to take a one hour's break. And then we return for questions and, and answers. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hearing Officer will resume at 1 o'clock.